Oh, good. Greetings. Morning, Jerry. Good morning. How are you doing? Okay. Good. Yourself okay, I hope. <sighs> Managed to give myself a little twinge on my hip yesterday, but otherwise good. Yeah. We all are pretty much locally good surrounded by difficult circumstances yeah exactly exactly and trying to figure out what to do about it right how to live under how to live exactly. where is socrates when we need him socrates <laughs> where's socrates yeah or bill and ted when we need them they could fix history hey mm -hmm. dave hey how are you guys doing good how are you you're away from home yeah charlottesville virginia Oh man, yeah, sweet. Looking after the mother-in-law. <laughs> Hi, Grace. Hi, guys. Um, Grace, have you been following the emergent event sense-making stuff that Pete has been doing? I forgot. I have not. I don't even know what you're talking about. Excellent. Which is why I'm bringing it up. Um, so I'll wait until the turmoil with the camera is over. <laughs> that might be a long wait, my friend. I oh, apparently there's more turmoil than we thought. Yeah, there's more turmoil than getting my camera the right way. But yeah, no, I don't. Yeah, I'd like to know what we're talking about today. I mean, I do have quite a lot of things going on. So I just want to like make sure it's like, yeah, I kind of came along because I didn't want you guys to think that I was so insulted that I stopped coming, but I've been having so much pressure at work that, I, you know, like it, it, hopefully it's on a topic where I can learn and contribute. And if not, no offense, I'm going to move on and do work. <laughs> sounds, sounds totally great. And this is just a normal check-in call. So we're going to go around the room and see what people are working on that is OGME. And if you'd like, we can go touch your whatever you're doing early so that you can feel free to drop off. And then we can actually hear what you're up to, which would be great. And so so Pete Kaminsky started a um, conversation on, and he started a new Mattermost chat channel, basically around emerging event sense making around the Delta variant of COVID. And he's like, how do we filter all the information? There's like way, way too much information coming in. It's really hard to make sense of what's happening. There are lots of nuances to what's going on. There's data being missed, all kinds of stuff like that. How do we make sense of that? And, um, and they had a, there was a call yesterday that he hosted uh, on Zoom uh, around this that I think he's recording and posting them online and stuff like that. So you could, you could you know, take a peek at it if you wanted to. Uh, but I think you'd be you'd, you'd find the conversation actually uh, useful and interesting to what you were bringing to our last call, um, to the last last conversation we had when you were here. Um, so happy to, uh, and I'll put some links to uh, uh, he meaning Pete Kaminsky. I mm -hmm. think you just dropped in. Yeah, uh, I think you dropped into the middle of that conversation, uh, Gil. And. Um, and I like the emerging event sense making a lot because I think that we as an entity, whatever we is, and there's a call Friday to figure out what more about what we think the entity is, um, uh, need to get good at managing events and making sense of them. If we're going to be about sense making, might as well be about important things that are happening in our lives and helping people navigate their way through those things. So that's the, that's the intent of the emerging event sense making. Uh, and we're, I'm hoping that we can generalize from that process 
some general lessons about event processing together as a community, right? I mean, on, on Wikipedia, they figured out to have current events pages. There, there was a brief, the Wikimedia Foundation, so the, the whole larger Wikipedia project briefly had a Wikinews site project. I don't know if it's even still alive, but I think they, I think they rapidly figured out that you can't untangle the news from the encyclopedia easily. So now there's you know, like current like current events kind of kind of pages uh, in the Wikipedia itself, and that gets really interesting. And their ability to be up on the news quickly and sort things well is great. And one of the things that Pete uh, screen shared during the call yesterday, I think it was during that call, it might have been a, in, a, in a separate conversation I had with Pete, was he went to the category COVID nineteen uh, page on Wikipedia. And for those of you who don't know, you can tag up any page to put it in inside of a category. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of a form of internal tagging. And it turned out that there was this really, really rich, like amazingly rich taxonomy uh, of tags inside of Wikipedia around COVID-19 and, uh, you know, effects on animals or this or that. Like, like each of those was a category that would, that, that told you how many pages were under that category that, that had a whole bunch of really interesting metadata about, about how all that worked. So, uh, and that was just one, 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 one kind of resource, one kind of place to go. Anybody else who's been involved in the emerging event sense making want to jump in and say something about it as well? There being no takers, let's proceed to the, uh, to the round, of, round of four, uh, round of 16 or whatever it is. Um, and I will urge us to use the Mattermost chat uh, as our, uh, the Mattermost chat channel called calls, OGM uh, in brackets and then calls as our chat. So we have a more persistent chat. Uh, and let's go, um, let's, uh, Grace, do you mind if we start with you? Uh, and sure. we'll go, we'll go Grace, Ken, Stacy. Yep. So I've just been continuing to work on my reputation currency project. Um, we're going to be doing a design sprint in September. Uh, probably in Germany, just confirming the dates for that. I've been getting a lot more referrals from a lot of people asking about different governance models. So that's been really exciting. So a lot of stuff going on. That's that. Sounds great. Um, Ken. I am just posting the Mattermost chat into the chat. So people who don't have it handy can access it. Thank you very much. Um, wow, Grace, that was so fast. I thought I had a minute to breathe. <laughs> Good morning, evening, afternoon, where it might be. Nice to see some old friends and new friends. Um, probably the most OG, OGME thing I'm working on is, um, thanks to Matt Saya, I've been hired as part of a facilitation team to work on a diversity and inclusion project for a global financial services firm. So there's another company involved that uh, created a, uh, an 80 minute uh, slide deck that we walk people through. And um, right now we're working at the director level. So these are all very senior people. And I would say that my personal experience is um, probably 80 to 85% of the folks are really on board with this and you know get it and they're very aware. And then there's a, a cohort of mostly over 50, mostly white um, people who are like, I don't get pronouns. You're either a man or a woman. That's it. You know, and um, there's just this recalcitrance on their part of opening their minds to understanding um, the difference between impact and intent. If I give you a compliment, it's meant as a compliment. If you take it as, a, as an insult, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. So it's just really interesting to try and, and you know, help broaden the, these people out. So what I try to do is say, if you know, if you come from a dominant culture and you're saying, wow, you know, you're so articulate, it may genuinely be a compliment on your part, but understand that if you've been part of a non-dominant culture, somebody has been traditionally marginalized and underrepresented, and you've heard your entire life, wow, you're so articulate, the unwritten uh, part being for a black person, a brown person, a woman, whatever, to put yourself in their shoes and, respond not from a defense of, I meant it as a compliment, but from curiosity of, thank you for helping me understand that. You know, what else do I need to know? How, what would it look like or sound like if I were to compliment you in a way that landed well for you? And I'd say 10% 10, 10 are getting that. And there's still 5% are just like, nope, 
I'm stuck. I, this is where I am. And to their credit, uh, you know, we're told just ignore those people as much as possible. Don't try and, and change their minds. They're, they're the really, they're the hardcore. You're not going to change their minds. So focus on where the, um, uh, where people are, are open. And um, I'm just, I'm learning a lot. I'm having a good time. Um, it's, it's a very interesting company to work with. And, it's very heartening to see how many people are um, open to this and, and really saying, uh, and the, the scenarios that are used were all uh, taken from <clears throat> inside the culture from interviews. So people were saying, you know, I'm not surprised, but I'm disappointed that these behaviors are still here and really would love to see it get eradicated. So um, it gives me great hope that, that a company like this, which has huge influence in the financial markets, is so engaged and involved in um, uh, in working on this, and to see how many people um, are very committed to doing it. So that's that's my OGME hopeful thing of the week. Um, thank you, Ken. That's super interesting. Anybody else with questions or, or thoughts on this? Because um, uh, you talked a bit about the trailing edge of people getting it uh, on issues like identity. Um, is there something fun happening at the leading edge? Is like, <clears throat> like, like what, what's, the, what's the positive end of this and the possible effects on the culture or the, the environment or even the industry or something like that and without divulging any, any state secrets? Um, well, it's interesting. <clears throat> a couple of things that come up to, to give a slight tangent. Are things that are endemic to every organization I've ever worked with, which are complaints about meetings um, and complaints about senior people. You know, they're saying that the most egregious offenses come from the most senior people, which are the old white men who've been there forever. And um, the question of are we really uh, committed to this? So uh, the good news is the CEO of the company opens this presentation with a three minute video saying, I'm committed. This is my work. I am committed to this. We need to do this. In order to create the kind of culture that will make us successful, we need to be more inclusive. And so um, I try to shift the focus from microaggressions, which many people have pointed out are actually macroaggressions, to simply inclusive and non-inclusive behavior. And that as more and more uh, people from around the world, because this is a global firm, enter the workplace, um, we need to slow down, which goes against their um, uh, their culture. It's a very speedy culture. Everybody has to you know, be on their feet, on their toes all the time. And recognizing that someone who comes in with English as a second, third, or fourth language might be difficult to understand, but they have really brilliant ideas. And if we don't slow down and make it possible for them to express themselves and not feel marginalized because of their accent, they're not going to get the kind of performance they need to be a market leader. And um, there seems to be great receptivity towards that. So um, I don't know a lot between the CEO and the director level. There's a whole layer of, of management in there. I, I've not been exposed to them. But the fact that the CEO is bought into this and is out there saying, this is where we're going, that you know, I am committed to this. I want every single person to do this. My question is, how will you stand up to be that person in this company? Um, and this is a financial services firm that um, you can probably figure out who I'm talking about just because they are extremely progressive. Um, they're leading the, the charge against, um, uh, you know, defunding from fossil fuels. And, you know, they're, if they are successful in this, I think other companies are going to follow their lead. So that to me is very, very heartening. Um, and the fact that there is buy-in from the very top, uh, there's the, the CEO is the champion of this program. Um, and then there's the fact that um, Matt, yeah. hold on a second. Uh, Mark, could you mute your, Mark, could you mute your line, please? Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, Kim. Then there's the fact that that Matt, for those of you who've who've been on the calls here with Matt, is involved. You know, who's such a brilliant guy and such a, a heartfelt man um, and deeply thoughtful. Uh, it it feels like you know there's just this OGME energy is getting into some juicy places in the world that have real. Uh, currency, haha, currency for financial services, currency and um, and uh, purchase, and you know this this has the potential to really ripple out. I think across um, several influential spheres of of commerce. Thanks, Ken. Thanks very much, uh, Gil. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. A question. Uh, um, first of all, Ken, thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I'm um, I love both what's going on and also how you've articulated it. Uh, it, it's rich and deep and thoughtful, and um, 
and hopeful. So thank you for that. I have a question, which is not one that I would ask out in the world, but I'm gonna guess that it's a safe space to ask it here because it's a weird question, um, which is, um, I don't even know how to quite articulate it. Um, um, are, there, are there limits to the DEI work? Um, do we, um, is, is, it, is it important for us to, at, at the largest scales accommodate to the least, to the smallest minorities of us? Um, does, do, do, do you envision this organization accommodating, you, you know, talk about people whose English is their fifth language, you know, does the organization need to slow down uh, to accommodate that or does it need to evolve into something different that can both accommodate that and be what it is? or what it needs to be. It's, it's not a well-formed question, but you get, you get the drift of what I'm asking? Yeah. <clears throat> part, part of the process here is, is reaching deeper and deeper into <clears throat> both marginalized, but also smaller, smaller minorities of people that, different, that, are different, that differ from the normative culture in various ways. And that's a good thing. But are there, are there system dynamic limits to that? And I don't know, need an answer right now, but I wonder if that provokes any thoughts for you. Um, certainly there's always system dynamic limits to everything. Um, and, 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 and I'll, I'll stipulate we're, we're not close, <laughs> but right. I want to ask the question anyway. Right. So, um, I think that, um, in my experience, slowing conversations down almost anywhere is always a good thing and to resist the pressure, um, you know, we're a very extroverted, fast moving culture. And so introverts often don't get, uh, the credit and the the airtime that they really need and deserve. You know, if you've read Thinking Fast, or Fast and Slow or um, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Won't Stop Talking, uh, Adam Grant's done a whole uh, search on, on leadership literature and discovered that it's almost all oriented toward extroverts. And if you have a very extroverted team, you want an introverted leader. If you have a very introverted team, you want an extroverted leader. So just learning how to work with people where they are. More and more neuroatypical people are being hired, particularly into uh, financial and tech firms because they have an ability to focus on detail that most of us do not have, but they also lack certain social and emotional skills. And that can be really challenging for the people in the office. So broadening out the, the emotional and relational intelligence, the social intelligence in the organization, I think can only be a good thing. Um, will we get to everybody? No, but if we can even expand it just, you know, 10, 20% beyond where it currently is, there's gonna be a huge uh, impact on, on industry. Um, and the other thing I would say, cause you said diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is not my favorite phrase. Um, I, I recently read a paper from, uh, or an article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review written by a black woman who has a company and they say, we focus on dignity, belonging, and justice. Um, as soon as you talk about diversity, you're starting to create boundaries and, and silos and categories, right? And as soon as you talk about inclusion, well, if they're included, then who's excluded? But if we look at dignity, are we granting every single person dignity? Are we creating a space where they can feel that they belong and is everybody treated fairly? That's the justice part. So I find that to be a much richer doorway and entry into this conversation, which ain't going away. And um, you know, the fact that businesses are now starting to engage with it seriously, uh, whereas some levels of government are just making things worse, I think is really hopeful. Does that help to answer your questions, Gil? Um, it, it helps very much. Thank you for that. And I like the, the dignity, belonging, and justice is very powerful. Uh and Gil, you're next in check-in. Gil oh. Michael Doug. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. So like Ken, I'm not prepared. Uh, Stacy we... Stacy was uh, next. No, no, no. Uh, I'm gonna Stacey, pass. In the, Stacey, Thank in, you. The, in the chat, she said, please skip me. So oh, okay, I'm sorry. But but also I'm thanks. just a justice warrior to this morning. I, I exactly and, <laughs> and thank you for playing that role, Mark. Yeah. Um gosh, okay. So um what can I tell you? Um I'm, I'm finding myself weirdly starting to accommodate to the notion of not having a physical social life again in the future. I'm, uh, a couple of colleagues of mine have been preparing a really juicy workshop for a uh, conference series I've been part of that is returning to physical this fall. Um, and we're starting to feel like, uh, actually, two of my partners who are older than me are saying they're not, they're not prepared to travel. 
in October. So I'm sort of in theory prepared to travel, but I recognize it may not happen. Um, um, extra factor for me, some of you know this, is my wife is immune compromised. And so we have a, you know, we have a cascading exposure and I need to, I need to be much more scrupulous than folks. So I'm sort of emotionally exploring the possibility of never going to conferences again or never hanging out with you all in the same place indoors. Um, and that's an extreme case, but uh, that's present for me now as a real consideration and it's very weird. Um, number one. Number two. Uh, but before, yeah. you leave, before you leave number one, I mean, never is a long time. I know. Um, if, if this pandemic were to have a third major spike and last another year, but then slow down and come back to normal, could you see coming back to normalcy then? I mean, maybe this just gets dragged out. But maybe the point is just dragged out further. You know, n n n never is not the real word here, but that's the emotional sense. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. Um, um, this could get dragged out. Um, you know, there's a possibility here that we're not looking at the COVID pandemic, but at a pandemic era. Uh, you know, the drivers that give us COVID, um, uh, human wild interface, uh, density travel, um, declining immune competence in the population, um, uh, rising temperatures from climate and so forth, the drivers are all still there. Uh, political but conflict that doesn't let us actually solve Political conflict, things. creeping fascism, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, intentionally driven social fraying, um, disinformation machinery, well-funded. You know, I mean, you, you all know this. I don't need to go through the list, but the drivers are all still there. Uh, and so the possibility of, of a successive pandemic or more than one happening uh, is, not, is not zero. I'm not, saying it's, I'm not saying it's dominant, but it's not zero. So that's some of what's behind that sense. Um, so let me say that. Um, number two, um, I, I, need, I need some, at some point, it doesn't need to be now, I need some sense-making about sense-making. Um, I, I, your experience may be different, but my experience is that that's not a term I've heard in my life and culture until fairly recently. Uh, and now I hear it everywhere. And I'm truly not sure what it means. Uh, and I have a concern, I guess, the, the, an, an un, un, unarticulated concern about that being something facile and diminishing rather than enriching, I don't know. So a puzzlement there. So just, you know, a question for the future. Um, um, before you move on, can we yeah. can we mix that one around in the group for a second? Because I think oh, that's sure. a, it's a yeah, clearly as, clear... as much as we want. Yeah, yeah clearly a great question. Um, and, and I think when humans get together to figure something out, they're sense making. So the term is really broadly like applicable. It's a little bit like systems thinking, where from my experience, if you scratch three systems thinkers, you'll get six different opinions about what systems thinking in theory is. And so, so it's worth really sort of diving in and, and thinking about the issue. Kevin, you want to jump in? Um, I was just going to talk about travel. Uh, I was planning to go back to Mississippi to my brother-in-law's memorial uh, next week. And uh, Mississippi's uh, infection rate is up 132% over last week. And they're going to do, they're, they're going back to social distancing and masking at the Catholic church where it will be. And they're going to have a scholarship, you know, in his name. And he was a great guy. And, but it's just, you know, geez, do I go back? You know, uh, you know, vaccinations are up 42% in Mississippi over last week, mm -hmm. but infections are up three times as much almost. Um, and, and I just, I wonder if I can afford to go back to Mississippi right now, uh, even though he was, you know, a great friend and my sister-in-law really would love us there. And I just, I, you know, I, I will go to conference and we're putting on conferences next spring. We hope people come, you know, I don't know, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but right now, you know, the, the cost of going back to Mississippi is just, it's curious. Maybe uh, beam the telepresence company has a special business right now, like dropping beams <laughs> in, in memorial services and other events where people mm. want to be present. So mm. you could sort of walk around with whoever is there and try to be present. I don't know totally making that up but but you know i would avoid going into any un, highly unvaccinated place right now like the plague i would I'd like the plague what is more, like more, the, more than the metaphor avoid the plague that's, that's more than metaphorically funny thing. this case. is a plague people don't avoid exactly exactly but people in mississippi are waking up i mean 42 percent up is is really but you know in in, in our county it voted 86 percent trump and it also is uh, vaccinated at around 15 percent 
<laughs> a 42% over a small number is, is still a small number, but, yeah. but at that growth rate, that would move someplace. Uh, Grace, did you want to jump in? You just had your hand up. I could, I mean, I could talk about this issue of travel. I mean, I was just really aware. I was talk. A, a friend and, and I went, uh, you know, we took like a vacation of a couple hours away. We didn't, you know, by driving and, you know, staying in an Airbnb and all this. And I was I'm really aware that this is new, right, in humanity's history. Like that even the ability to just, oh, I'm going to get on a plane and travel or I'm going to travel frequently. I mean, when I was a kid, we went camping because it was too expensive to do any other way. And so like, it's so amazing how we feel like these things have become necessities and rights when actually it's, it's the people who would travel from one country to another was a very, very, very small portion of humanity just a couple generations ago. And and really starting to look at, well, actually, there's something very important about knowing your own, you know, your own community. And, you know, my religion has the, this, you know, on Saturdays, you're not allowed to travel. And you can see how that creates cohesion. And, and so, you know, I'm really looking at that inside of my sense making as well Is this, wait, wait a second, like how many of these things that I feel like should be my rights are just actually like completely unnecessary bullshit. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I do think about those same things like, you know, never seeing my family again is on the table because I don't feel comfortable flying. And I don't know if I'll ever feel comfortable flying again. For, for many reasons, environmental reasons, as well as pandemic reasons that, you know, right. I don't think this is going away. The pandemic's not going away. So I think space tourism is off your plate as well. I love air so very, very much. I will not go anywhere that they do not have air. And I cannot imagine why anybody would. Air is pretty good. We like air. Just we like air a lot. That. In fact, sometimes we have too much air. Oh, sorry. Um, I got plenty of hot air over here anyway. That's, that's my two cents about the travel and the, you know, like how much our privileges have become rights. It's, it's almost, wow, yeah. Thanks, Grace. Ken, and then Mark. Speaking of air, um, this is, I couldn't think when you asked if anybody who was on the call yesterday wanted to speak, but um, Pete's wife, Joanna, who's very knowledgeable about the Delta variant, brought up the fact that something that is missing out of almost every single uh, conversation about the about the pandemic is air purification that you know given that it is a respiratory illness that is spread through uh, droplets and aerosols um, we should be installing high quality air filtration everywhere you know in classrooms in 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 markets in offices they did it on airplanes but you know um, it would really help to cut things down. And I was just reading, you know, Washington Post had this big long article of what you need to do to take care of yourself. And they didn't once mention air filtration. So, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a very great opportunity here for a technical fix that would not solve things, but would certainly lower the temperature quite a bit. Exactly, thanks, Ken. Mark Kronza. Well, good morning, I am in Lacey, Washington. Um, 500 miles from home um, on a two week road trip um, in a convertible Saab, which oddly enough, the air conditioning works. Um, so uh, <laughs> multiple options here. I am immune compromised. I do have a reaction to the uh, uh, vaccine, but nobody knows what those numbers mean. And I'm on my way to Fort Townsend where my cousin Michelle is the mayor, and we have cousins who have multiple myeloma, and uh, boy, it's kind of a, a tricky thing, kind of, you know, this cousin with multiple myeloma and Alzheimer's, kind of the last time I might be able to come up and see him. Um, so there's kids flying in from Connecticut. It's the family reunion that... Uh, we were all excited about before the second wave, and now we are in a state of confusion. I'm trying to communicate with uh, people I've known all my life, and, and nobody knows what to do. Thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm hoping it all turns out gracefully. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Stacy. Yeah, so ironically, I just got a call from my daughter 
She's uh, 28 and she was totally opposed to the vaccine. There was nothing that I could do. To, I didn't, uh, you know, I had to be careful because, you know, you're dealing with somebody very, very headstrong. But, and I was going to say that it's very strange because where I am, it's a very vaccinated area. And I'm listening to everybody here that has really reasonable fears. But I'm also so aware that there's a pocket of people that I went to high school with. They don't even believe it's real. I mean, they're mocking me. They're laughing at me. So her calling, I just want to share what made her get it is she started seeing somebody that won't see her unless she got it. So she that's, got it. That's the answer. We should create a dating service for people <laughs> who are stuff. Vax exclusive. So I just wanted to share that because it was strange that she would call now. Like and, she, and she was sick as a dog, though. <laughs> Yeah. Over, it, she had a bad reaction. Thanks, Stacy. Sure. Um, sense making anyone? Uh, let's. I'd like to go back to um, Gil's question. Dave, did hey, you want I to put question? something in the mother most about sense making? Yeah, thank you. A, a, a video, a music video. Well, no, yeah, it's the whole text. The music, music video belongs to it. It's a whole oh, okay. text about, and oh, it has sorry. to. I didn't. I didn't scroll up yet. Go ahead. Uh, do you want to no, explain a little bit? Yeah, maybe. I um, for me, I understand that the uh, the body and the experience is a is a very deep intelligence, and the way we use words often doesn't really reach what we understand from our experience. And I'm understanding this more and more. I've talked about Eugene Jenlin before, where they try to gradually find words for the implicit or the felt sense or whatever, and in this kind of sense making ideology you could you, it's good that you try to make sense but there's plenty of it also that about staying true to your experience uh regardless of how much sense you make of something because a lot of times when people try to make sense there's kind of a mental tension on something and i can feel this is not really what i feel is true but people tend to agree on stuff because it's kind of makes sense but then it's it makes sense here but doesn't make sense here or something and, and like the way our somatics um, work or our whole being or our internal system there's much more that you can't make sense of than is being acknowledged currently i think that's my my my, my attempt on trying to convey what i tried to convey in that post as well yeah. i don't know if this makes sense <laughs> I know. Thanks, Eric. Um, anybody else? Sense making. Uh, well, I Mark think what, what Eric is saying oh. about music is really important. Uh, it's possible that given the state of the world, that it's only going to be song and music that's going to cut through to create enough leverage uh, to actually change things. So examples of this from history are basically freedom songs from the civil rights era or what, like, I'm, I'm not sure music does change that much, does it? No, but it does, like, whenever you see like one of the greatest speech in the world, is it just about the words or is it also about the musicality, for instance? Right. Or, and how it enters or common understanding or and also i'm not talking about music as if that's the answer i'm talking about music as an example to explain what actually happens in language and how we actually don't understand really most of the time we don't really get it like it, right. and how the experience itself is a much richer body than our thinking minds in our current western philosophically logically scientifically oriented minds it's still a lot of training because it's not just only the body. It's it's like the, the, the Eastern approach then is, yeah, it's just the ability to listen to the body, but then they forget about thinking. No, it's both together and how that works is a whole thing by itself. And, and a, a very nice definition of art, I mean, a, a very nice way of thinking about art for me is that it's a form of sense-making of the world. Uh, another way of thinking about art that I like a lot is that it's a gateway to the other space, the other dimensions that art, really good artists are sort of curators of those gateways to that other set of realities that are around us that are not tangible, not measurable, 
uh, need to be expressed, need to find some 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 feeling, some expression in the world. And so, uh, so art, for me, art is, a, is def definitely a form of sense making. Uh, Dave, did you want to jump in, and then Hari? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and I was. I mean, I, I had some of the same reaction, Gil, and um, and last year, and maybe this is particularly in, in the context of OGM and stuff. It, I had the experience last year with uh, the Global Regeneration Collab, where a number of folks got together to do a, a kind of review of the year sense making process, where we we had four or five sessions where we kind of discussed, you know, what what had what had been impactful, what did people remember, what did they what did they felt through the process of involved engaging with the GRC, and kind of what was important and what would they want to do going forward, and and then actually drafted a document that kind of were the the results of that conversation. And the results were much more, they were different than I would have expected the GRC to be when I got started. Um, you know, they were much more, I kind of expect things to be kind of technocratic and, you know, how do you fix agriculture and, you know, the, what, what Klaus is doing with the food systems and things like that. The results from the analysis were much more around healing of trauma, internal regeneration, much more personal kinds of things. And I felt like, the process made by by looking back at the GRC activity, there was sense that was made out of the process that I didn't understand from before. So it was, in some sense, I translated it to looking to see what people do instead of asking what they think. You know, it was like we could look at what we were doing, you could see what people were actually in conversation about. You know, and then and then and then that was where the sense came from. So I, I don't know if that's exactly what's ever meant by it uh, in other contexts, but that's the, that's the meaning I took from this one experience. And okay. the, the group, having the group get together and have these in, these in this format enabled this sense to emerge in a way that many other formats wouldn't. So. I love that, Dave, thank you. And you made me think of the difference between mental common sense and sense-making of the senses and sensory and extrasensory things. And those are very different realms for me. And I think sense-making, it's really easy to think of sense-making as just being the logical side. <clears throat> like, hey, sense-making would be finished if we had the perfect visualization of the uh, irrefutable argument, that would be sense-making. And actually that, that, that wouldn't necessarily move things forward uh, in a group, for example. Uh, yeah, and I, I guess that gives a name to one of my concerns there is that, uh, I, and I don't know this well enough, my intuition is that that's what a lot of people mean by it, not what Dave said or what you just said, but that, and that concerns me if that's the case. Uh, why does it concern you? Because we're, the world is much too unsettled to wind up with a perfect visualization of, you know, oh, all, yeah. you know da, 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 all that stuff. So, right. So um, I, I'm, 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 I guess my concern is about it turning into something that's too facile, trendy and facile. But anyway, you know, like, like I said, it's very, this, this, is, <laughs> this is a sense about sense making and my lack of sense about what it means. So it's unformed. Well, we all know the world is run by mice and the answer is 42. So there is some simplicity behind the whole thing. That's true, uh, I forgot. Yeah, H Hari then Ken. Uh, yeah, hi. So, uh, so first of all, it's nice to be back on these calls, and uh, you know, I'm coming back after a long time. So, if I'm jumping in with my sense of sense making, and it's not making sense, uh, you know, uh, kindly excuse. Excellent. But, yeah. um, <laughs> so, uh, one thing which uh, I guess a couple of things which which uh, sort of have been uh, concerning me for maybe like a couple of years now is one of them is what was just brought up, which is the non analytical, non-reductive, non, uh, what do you call it, neat and, you know, closed form kind of uh, conclusions we can draw from, uh, you know, the environments which we navigate. And one of the things which I've been doing to try and process the world a little differently is to, uh, you know, write down my dreams every morning and try and see if I can see patterns in them, so on and so forth. I believe it's, you know, been a, like a, it's 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 uh, people throughout the ages have recorded their dreams, um, including you know some of the prophets in the Bible and so on and so forth. But uh, it really, uh, once I started doing that, I realized like how little of uh, you know like my experience is actually captured through the conscious experience. And there's so much uh, which is happening, you know, under the hood of it. And uh, the other part which I'm still thinking about, and does it connect to this in some ways? Uh, you know, if we made machines which could sense, right? So what is the equivalent of that kind of, uh, you know, intuitive, non-reductive sensing for them? Is it like 
the inner layers of the neural networks? Is it you know the transfer learnings which happen so on and so forth? So those are the questions I'm wondering about. And uh, I mean, obviously coming from an Indian culture, I also since I practice yoga and meditation, I look at things from the inside out because of the way the classes are structured sometimes. And uh, you know, it's it's, it's just uh, the never-ending puzzle, I guess. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Hari. Really appreciate that. And also, like um, April, my wife took a yoga teacher training a couple of years ago, at which this particular kind of training went deep into the yamas and the niyamas from so the background of yoga and all that. And man, that's a sense-making framework about non-attachment, about self-care, about a whole bunch of different things. It really, like, really, there, there's a, a philosophical foundation that that is all about how to be in the world and hopefully hopefully improve the world. So I was, uh, and it's been there for a couple thousand years. There's uh, also, since you mentioned, yeah, since you mentioned it, it's quite interesting because there is a sense-making framework uh, sort of, if I could just. We just lost your audio. mentioned built into the yoga thinking. I mean, is, Mm. Uh, can you start, uh, Hari? Can you start over again? We, we're, your audio is cutting out on us. We'd love to hear what you're saying. I was this. I'll pass. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just saying. If you read the, uh, you know, the yoga system, the the sutras which were written about, or which were recorded about two thousand years ago by Patanjali, there is actually an integrated sense making system which is called samyama, which means integration. It's a combination of. Uh, you know, like withdrawal of the senses and, you know, focusing and, uh, you know, like uh, finally integration. So I translate it just to mean flow, but uh, there has been like some attempt uh, based on psychology and based on uh, kind of, you know, like uh, the approach of detachment and, you know, like uh, focusing on the consciousness, focusing on the breath. There, there is a sense-making apparatus and an epistemology in uh, Eastern thought, which is pretty interesting to explore because it it, uh, it addresses the, uh, you know, like, uh, I, I mean, anybody in the Greek school of thought is used to the, is kind of like a logical reductio ad absurdum kind of thing, but it's, it's a different kind of mode, a different kind of gear. And uh, I think both are super important because uh, we need the mathematics, but we also need, you know, the Kurt Gedel who went outside mathematics to, and sense make, you know, sense, made like to find that, you know, so I'm just saying that it's, it, these are tools and we should make the best use of them. I've talked a lot, thank you. Oh, thank you, I love what you're saying. Um, <laughs> Ken and Mark Carranza. So, um, you know, I think this is a fantastic question. Thanks for raising it. Um, I've, uh, I look at sense-making as a territory rather than a category. Um, and with any territory, you can have multiple maps. You can map, you know, the, take any landscape, you can look at the, the water flows and the topography and, you know, the population and vegetation. And so I think we need to start to have some maps like this for sense making of, um, you know, there's certainly the internal, there's what do I, what do I make sense of in my own world? How do I make sense of my body? You know, Simone Biles just got a lot of shit for um, uh, withdrawing from some competitions. I was reading about this and she had lost her sense of proprioception which is incredibly important when you're spinning in the air and there's all this rotation going on. She gets severely injured herself and she took care of herself. So um, I'm reading this book or I'm listening to this book right now called uh, The Expanded Mind, Thinking Beyond the Brain by Annie Murphy Paul. And I really like it. Um, I don't care for her voice. She's narrating it, but I really like what she has to say. She opens the book by talking about um, uh, traders, really high, uh, product, high performing traders. And you can take someone who has the, a really high honors degree from one of the best universities and has all these advanced you know, math courses and they can't trade for shit. And you take somebody who's a mediocre student who came out of a state school and they're making trade after trade that's just making money. It turns out it has to do with interoception. These folks know in their heartbeats and they can sense whether a trade is good or not. It's way below the, the threshold surface of thinking consciousness. Um, there's a lot of study that goes, that's, that's gone behind this to, to discover that, um, like they did an experiment giving people, um, four decks of cards and, and you, you find out as you play them that the first two decks are loaded with bad cards and they cost you money. And the 
the third, second, third and fourth deck are great. But it, it took the people like 40 or 50 plays before they could actually figure that out, although they had wired up their bodies and their bodies knew it within 10 plays. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a huge amount of intelligence in our body that we ignore at our peril. And, um, you know, that can also couple with our environment. Um, you know, you walk book? into a room. Sorry, what? What's the name of that book? Uh, the, I put it in the matter was check. In the matter was check. Yeah. Okay. Um, so th- there's lots of ways that we can, that we can, um, connect to our environments that we're, we're usually not aware of. You walk into a room and you instantly know, oh, I want to go talk to that person. They just feel right. You know, where you walk in and go, oh man, there's something going on here that I'm not sure of. I got to be really careful. These are not things where we've scanned the room and gone through a big analysis. It's, it's like an instantaneous knowledge because our bodies have, have co-evolved with our environments and with, the, with fellow people. And there's a huge amount of, of intelligence there that gets ignored in our sense making, which leads us to make nonsense out of things that should make sense. And um, so I just wanted to advocate for, as we, as Pete and others engage in this emergent sense making process, that we start to map these different domains of, you know, where are you feeling the pulse? You know, what, what is this to you? And, um, and collectively, how do we, how do we reconcile when people have really different um, views on things? A lot of people are disconnected from their bodies, which give them really scary perspectives. Um, Saban Fusame was talking about bringing these women from Germany to Africa, and they just kept talking and talking. They were totally disconnected. They took them down to the river, had them lay down, coated them in mud and just said, be quiet. And they, they went through an enormous change in consciousness, simply from laying on the ground, being covered in mud next to the river. They started to hear things that they had not heard before. So being able to quiet the chatter of the mind is also really important, which gets to Hari's point about yoga and meditation and quieting our, our senses down so that we can actually hear the signal through the noise. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful, Ken. And it, and it suggests to me that there's, you know, there's an interesting difference between maybe sense making and sensing. Mm. Uh, and the term sense making itself suggests to me, and I don't know if this is the common use, suggests to me some kind of uh, 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 mental, intellectual, thought based process, and sensing is 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 body based. Um, and maybe what this is about, what, what, maybe what we are all hungry for in this game of sense making is how to orient in the world, uh, you know, and how to be in a world that's changing and that doesn't quote make sense in the way, in the traditional historical ways that we have been acclimated to. Um, and so I guess, you know, so I, I think you're coming close to what my concern is that if we think that if sense making is about figuring shit out, um, it feels limited and maybe dangerous to me. If it's about how to sense with the whole being in a, you know, in a, in a, in a changing or disorienting world, that feels much richer and more open to possibility. So thank you very much for that. Let me add a brief comment, then go to Mark Carranza, Kevin, and Eric. Uh, <laughs> and, and my brief comment is that my own perception is that we are trying to make sense of the world through the modernist lens, that we have mostly been raised in the modernist point of view, which means science and rationality and logic and whatever, which dismisses and discounts the other, uh, you know, uh, Ken just mentioned Saban Fusome, her, her ex-husband Maladoma uh, gets a Western training, goes back into his tribe in, in, in the Dagar tribe in West Africa and realizes a lot of things that are super interesting to understand. Uh, Tyson Yonka Porta uh, in Sand Talk is trying to communicate in really interesting ways, a book totally worth reading, uh, how to see differently outside of the modernist lens. And I think that in many of our conversations, we are so rational that the idea of a, of a perfectly rational argument, which is a useful object as, as solving any kind of problem is probably unrealistic in the broader world, which I think is where this conversation is kind of swirling around. Uh, so, and then we've got Doug added to this queue as well. So Mark Carranza. Um, this is rich stuff. Um, Gil, thank you for that one question. I um, heard about making in 1996 and uh, still haven't figured out what it is. Um, uh, Hari inspired me to kind of pop in and kind of a question I've been asking myself, and it feels like the wrong question. The question doesn't make sense. And Mark, your voice is cutting in and out. I think that your audio may still be t- attached to your earphones because it sounds like you're farther away than your laptop right now. But keep going. Sorry uh, about that. It's I'm having problems with that. But uh, okay. please, you know, 
I'm trying to ask a question. I don't know how to articulate. What is the opposite of prayer? Oh. And, you know, my work is about kind of getting the language out in the brain, out of the brain, to typing all the stuff in so that I can deal with non linguistic states of mind to kind of kind of say, okay, done with done with language. We've, we've, I've given attention to the monkey mind. You, you're, you're trying to get beyond language by capturing all these words. That's fascinating. Yeah, it seems to work for me, but I don't know how to be a preacher. I don't know how to be a, a, a leader of... What's the opposite of preaching? Listening. Yeah, listening, really. Um, anyway, there's the, there's the other side of it where basically we live in an environment of meaning. Somehow life evolved from matter. Later, or maybe at the same time, meaning evolved from you know, matter. And there's a kind of meaning that we call symbols. If we look at um, Charles Sanders Peirce's emergent semiotics of icon, which needs to refer to another icon for indexical reference and a multiple of indexes to symbolic reference where we can disconnect from the world and say cat, and the cat doesn't exist. But we can all kind of know what a cat is. And we have language. And this is language that's been infected in us by our cats and, and the rest of the world outside of us. But Michael Pugliani in his books about personal knowing makes this point that all knowledge to be known it has to go through the mind of a single knower. And there's this real paradox of single and mass community kind of thing that I see at the essence of the symbolic nature of sense making. Certainly there is, um, for example, a book how Forests Think, which talks about the Ecuadorian Amazon folks who engage in the forest in a non-symbolic way, but in this kind of iconic and indexical layer of, of meaning, how things are recognized and how they refer to each other. And this, you know, all three, I mean, language is beautiful. I love, I love this. Um, ability to listen to people all over the world out there right now. I'll, I'll just bring those up and <coughs> I'll pass it along to Eric or to Zach. Yeah, thank you. Um, Eric, uh, Doug, Mark, Thibault. Yeah, hey, was that next? Okay. I, yeah. uh, so the, for me, there's another part in in this idea that it's the body, that's also not really correct, if I have understood. It's a, um, like if you imagine something in your brain, you have an imagination which is a picture, a visual, it can happen consciously, it can also happen that it happens to you, like all of a sudden you've got this image coming up for you. Those are different ways of thinking, which is not just the body, it's an imagination. So there's plenty of thinking, which is nonverbal thinking, which is not just the body. So that, 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 that's another mistake, I think, is that it's like a dichotomy between the thinking mind and, 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 and the body, which I don't think it is. There's plenty of other thinking ways that are nonverbal that we don't learn to name. So they don't really exist, but they exist all the time because they lead us all the time. Um, so that's one part I wanted to name. And a second completely different part of it is in what we are doing in the OGM and all, all the kind of like, like uh, people sometimes get impatient with OGM or other groups on how it's not moving forward and how we're not really doing stuff or something or we're not putting this into the world. There's something on 
there is a very difficult tension field between trying to figure it out, trying to make sense, trying to all this information and putting in it, and then and then a mind that wants to focus and move forward. It's a weird one because once you start focusing, you try to pin it down. Where do we focus? You try to name goals, deliverables, really concrete stuff. And then there's this mind that's like, yeah, and I'm seeing all these other, <laughs> and this tension field that I'm also interested in, like how do we really focus, move forward, do stuff, become effective, uh, save lives, um, prevent, uh, I don't know, genocide, wars, um, uh, global warming, all these kind of stuff. And at the same time, stay open and sensitive and caring and supportive. So that's uh, that's another part for me. Yeah. Despite all the bad news, um, I'd just like to take us into silence for a, a little moment so we can just ponder what Eric just put into the conversation. as we reflect on the gentle nature sounds of a tapping on a keyboard. Um, Doug, then Mark Thibault. Okay, I'm, I think that make sense making really comes from <clears throat> the conventional sentence, uh, does it make sense? Which means, does our thought map back into reality? Uh, does our thought go through the senses back to the world? And that's what does it make sense means. That's what it means to me. And I think it's kind of implicit in the discussion. Uh, I'm going to turn this into my uh, check-in too. So two quick thoughts on my mind. One is I've been very taken up this last couple of weeks with the issue of China. Uh, and we project all over China and don't stop to th think whether we could do better at sense making uh, of getting our mental ma maps about China to fit reality. The problem right now is we're marching very quickly towards nuclear war with China. Uh, where's our peace movement? I don't see it. Uh, we're in trouble and uh, it's not being called out. Uh, the last thing that's on my mind is uh, with regards to climate change, I think the reality is that everybody's trying to get from where we are to better, and we're probably going to have to go through some breakdowns and worse before we can possibly get to better. And we're not talking about what to do with that breakdown, uh, how to take care of people who lose their homes or their food or their incomes. Uh, in a conversation last night, we really got to the phrase, each one save one is gonna be important. That's it. I think that there are some movements like deep adaptation, Jim Bendel's movement that are trying to work on some pieces of what you're talking about, but not enough and not widespread enough. But there's some people who are saying, we've really, we're, we've screwed this thing way further than we think we have. We need to take drastic measures for like, helping those people who are affected for figuring out how to sort our way through the, the rest of this time. Um, Mark Thibault, then Grace. Okay, don't be shocked, I shaved. Oh my God, what happened? <laughs> You've turned into I am pay. Monks, you know, <laughs> they ambushed okay. me and they said that that was not enough. So love it. Yeah, as well. Thank you. Excellent. Or Seth Godin, maybe, like somewhere between <laughs> IMP and Seth Godin. <laughs> It'll go back, at least there. Um, oh, wow. So, so, so many great uh, thoughts and, and, and topics we've touched on. Um, yes, How Forest Things is a, is a wonderful book that I, I, I often, I often uh, you know, in the spaces that I'm um, navigating and, and being involved in um, around the Amazon, I was uh, 
remind people how indigenous people identify, self-identify, and they self-identify, uh, you know, their health is um, dependent on the health of the forest. So they self-identify with the forest. So a tree is more than just a piece of wood. Um, also, when, when I entered, you know, a lot of conversation, I, I, I like to remind people that words are, and I'm, being, and I'm being very generous when I say that, words are about 50% of what we are. Um, they're very, very difficult to, uh, most languages are incomplete and imperfect. Um, one, one of the things that, that I remember uh, while we were talking is um, the, the test of uh, Sun Tzu's art of war on concubines. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, and, and so the king asked uh, uh, Sun Tzu, uh, almost, almost a challenge, can you know, his art of war uh, be applied to women? And he said, yes, of course. So 180, 180 of the uh, king's concubines are asked to perform um, army drills. And he puts uh, two of the favorite king con king's uh, concubines as general. And he says, you know, if the orders are clear, but uh, are not uh, applied correctly, then it's the fault of the soldiers. And if the words are uh, unclear, then it is a fault of the general. Um, and uh, um, of course, the concubines, being concubines, they laugh, they Google, they giggle. And at the end, um, he beheads, he orders to beheads two of the favorites concubines. That's when the king intervenes and says, no, uh, we find with the example, uh, we would like to save the two concubines. But uh, Sun Tzu goes and beheads uh, the, the two concubines and repeat the drills. And this time, um, the concubines obey very well. But um, the king still wants to stop the, the drill. And uh, Sun Tzu's conclusion is the king is only fond of words and can, cannot translate them into deeds. And that's, I think, is happening in, um, around a lot of the uh, uh, issues that we're facing. Thank you. Um, we, have, uh, we have way too many, you know, uh, we talk about the vaccines all the time, and, and, and I'm always surprised that we don't speak of the context of in which uh, vaccines are made and, and, and uh, you know, administered to the population and the place of the government in them and really questioning that as well in the sense making uh, what is the role of government really at this point in time is there is there do, do they even have any legitimacy into telling us what to do that has been lost a little bit in conversations and I think that we always uh, tend to point to people who are unvaccinated. I want to remind, you know, everyone here that uh, for a while, both our president, current president and vice president uh, sounded like anti-vaxxers for a while. But nobody said anything. And today they point to the other side, the Republicans being anti-vaxxers. It's like, Okay, well, where are we going with that? To, to, again, I think that the more, the more we're looking at this, the more they're losing legitimacy. Um, and, and I'm good with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Grace, then Michael. Yeah. So I think there's, there's, some, so there's a couple things I want to address inside of the sense making. One is sense making for what? And I want to kind of riff up of what um, Mark just said before I kind of go back to sense making in general, but um, for what? And when we talk about the vaccines is really interesting because it's like, am I trying to sense make on what's best for me or what's best for my family or what's best for my whole society? Because the answer to that is very different. And so vaccines have been kind of presented to us 
as something like, you know, you've got to send your kid to war. And we know that it's a little dangerous, right? These vaccines, they're new, it's a new technology. We know that there's some risks involved, but you know, it's the best thing for society. And that's how it's been introduced to us. Um, and that's a very different decision than you as an individual should get them. And now when we're talking about vaccinating children, certainly it's really not for the children, it's for all of society. But I think we're at a point, you know, eight months later since the vaccines have been released, where we can see that we are not going to reach mass immunity. We're not going to, through vaccines alone. It's just not going to be happen. And so then the question is, okay, now are we back to personal choice? And I'm asking myself that too. Like, why do I keep trying to make sense of this situation, right? And part of it is, okay, now they're talking about a third booster, right? And so that's, you know, I have to make, right? So we're making sense. Is it personal or is it for the, all of society? And I find it difficult to believe at this point that there is a case for herd immunity at all, especially with the reinfection rates, the rest of the world, most of the world isn't anywhere near 60% vaccinated. Canada is probably the exception. So if you're not Canadian, I don't think there's a case that vaccinations are going to reach herd immunity. And so then it's why, and, and again, you could disagree with me, but I'm just saying, you know, the question is, am I trying to decide, you know, for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my children, and obviously I'm very concerned about my children, um, should they get that extra booster? Or should they get another vaccine? Or should I vaccinate myself? Is that a health decision for myself or is it a community decision? And I think that's true of all sense-making, right? You can't make sense-making unless you've got that, why am I making sense-making? And then the, and that, and the other thing I wanna say about vaccines, which comes into the sense-making, and I think it's really important for us to look at this, is if you look at historically, just sense-making around um, disease, and sense making around totalitarianism and fascist activities and disease. There's a reason it's called ethnic cleansing. And it always starts with those ones are the ones who are contaminating us. And in the current debate, you're seeing both sides. You're seeing people saying the unvaccinated are the ones who are contaminating us and we can need to not let them into our restaurants. And then you're seeing people on the other side saying, the vaccinated are the ones who are creating more variants because of natural selection, it, because it's a big serial passage test where you're 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 exposing the um, you're exposing the virus to uh, you know uh, a, a a particular thing over and over again and it's evolving right and so you've got both sides claiming the other side is the diseased people we need to ban from our whatever, our restaurants, our events, our society, our weddings, our whatever. And you got literally brother against brother now. And so you're really getting close to Stalinism and you have to be really aware of how you're speaking about the other side inside of what are you about to do when you say those ones can't come to my whatever and it's right to ban them. And one of my concerns, for example, is you know, I look at here in Europe and Europe is somewhere around 50% and you can get a vaccine if you want, okay? And that's where we're gonna be. People are gonna not vaccinate more than 50, 60% here. I, it's just not gonna happen. And when you look at what's happening in France and you're not gonna be able to go to restaurants, there's things that I feel really like totally fine about like restaurants and, you know, theaters, but then you start to think about public transportation and now, you're putting something on the lower income people, right? The people who can't afford a car. How would I expect this? <laughs> you don't wanna know how I'm gonna say, suggest to handle this better. I think that, again, inside of we don't trust the authorities, I think the only way to do it is to allow people to make their own decisions and to allow open debate and stop the censorship and not shame anybody, right? Like not shame anybody and not say, you know, I can't believe, you know, so-and-so won't vaccinate themselves and I can't convince them is like, that's shaming. And same on the other side, I can't convince them that, you know, it's horrible that they got a vaccination. You know, both of those are kinds of shaming. 
we just have to cut it out and treat each other as adults, especially our own families. I mean, it's just, we got to cut it out and let people make their own decisions and stop allowing the government to make those decisions for us. And any proprietor who doesn't want people of this ilk or that ilk on his premises, that's fine. And anybody who doesn't want to date persons of this ilk or that ilk, that's fine. Let's stop allowing ourselves to be mandated by our governments. That's more dangerous. That's not going to end well. And that's what I think should be done. I mean, again, that's what I think should be done. I want to go back to sense making. Um, sense making, this question of like who's doing sense making and whether it's about our senses, there's a very good course. I wouldn't say an amazing course, but a very good course by uh, Rebel Wisdom called Sense Making 101. And it's, I think it's six or eight sessions. And more than half of that is learning to feel your own senses and understand your own biases. And so that's really interesting. So like I noticed, I started noticing, for example, the people that I like to listen to about this, they tend to be non-conventional. They tend to go into much more detail about the studies that they're looking at and talk about the biology. And I'm like, oh, my parents are biologists. That's why I like to talk, to listen to them. My father's a virologist. I understand what they're saying. And I don't wanna hear any general stuff. I want them to go into details and I want them to explain the biology underneath it. And that's my personal bias. And so that's really interesting, right? Like if I didn't know, oh, these people sound like my parents, I wouldn't know that I'm making sense through a lens of who do I trust? Um, and um, I think you know the answer, Stacy. I think we should let the government leave us alone. The government is not making good decisions for us. I, I don't feel, so it, like if you wanted to ask like, how do I feel about masking or not masking? I don't think I'm more qualified than the government and I'm not more qualified than a doctor. No, but my question is which government because it's the local, it's the, you know, the um, state governments that are making the mandates against masking in schools. Yeah, well, I think they should listen to the people. Why don't we listen to the people? Maybe get a vote on it or a referendum on it. Let's do what a democracy would do. I, I, don't, I don't think the government should be doing that. So At should proprietors point, because, they're because they're incompetent. So should proprietors be able to say no black people in this establishment? That's a different story. That's not why is that story. how is that different? Where is the difference? I think that's not a health, that's not a health issue, right? Right now we have to say, I want to as the proprietor, I want to protect my health. I'm immunocompromised and I don't want people who might have infectious disease coming into. I'll let them eat on the sidewalks or whatever it is, right? I think it's a personal health issue. You're not going to get the. You're not going to turn black if a black person breathes in your restaurant. But back to what you were saying before of the other as the contagion. If you, if you the proprietor think that black people are carriers of disease, you're going to ban mm -hmm. black people. Is that okay? Yeah. It's, that okay? Look, you're saying what's the difference between having common sense and not having common sense? Okay, yeah. it's a contagious disease. Common okay. sense. <laughs> Right. Let's not pretend that COVID isn't a contagious disease. It's a contagious disease. A lot of people say it isn't. The let's, you know, like I think we have to have some guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think we have to have some guidelines. Like what is a disease and what isn't a disease? So I just, Grace, I want to thank you for putting this in front of us in, in, a, in, a, yeah. All right. kind, kind, in a kind and gentle way. Um, and I'm not trying to end the conversation on this. I just like... I think you're you're provoking a lot of us to think uh, think through the issues that we've made assumptions about and things like that, which is uh, really useful and is a great form of sense making. And I think we're all completely unqualified to. Be. I mean, if you think you know what's going on right now, you are truly lost. <laughs> um, let's go to Michael and Mark Thibault. Um, I'm, uh, I'm on, on a different, uh, note, but, but related to sense-making, um, and actually, um, interested in, in kind of tying together, uh, the notion, the, the conversation that we had at the beginning of this call about, about, you know, growing out of Ken's work, um, and talking about uh, sensitivities in the workplace and um, 
you know, there, there are, I think there's, there's an intersection here between those um, kind of instinctual reactions that we have that we're talking about in terms of the, the bodily reaction um, uh, sensing of things and the learned linguistic um, figuring out of things. And I'm just wondering if there's, you know, less of a hard line between those learned linguistic figured out things and the in instinctual sensory bodily unthinking ones. Because when we think about the things that make an individual recoil versus making them feel, you know, relief, um, it, it might be a completely born innate response, but it also has to do with um, learned expertise, experience, you know, nurture. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about how as a designer, for instance, my conscious knowledge feeds unconscious reactions. I might have a bodily reaction to the difference between comfortable and uncomfortable letter spacing or color choice. And a musician can react to an off note or that a non-musician might notice. And the musician is reacting before any intellectual perception. Um, and then, you know, in the, in the kind of DEI context, and I'm using DEI as shorthand, understanding that that's not necessarily the greatest term, but um, that there are, there are visceral, visceral, visceral reactions of, um, of comfort and discomfort that somebody has because of their identity that again can be innate or learned and to know, to be able to, to um, harness the, the reaction that someone different than you has to the use of the word articulate in a context without a figured out and written response um, is, is likewise really, really valuable. And um, I guess, you know, th this all boils down to for me that in collaborative sense making, content output, you know, the, the, the things that we are making sense of, the, the kernels that we are making sense of, we want to attach um, annotation that is figured out, but to me, uh, like sort of, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to, how to, what to call it, but another important thing to figure out ways to capture are those those call them instinctual, call them bodily, you know, the, the reactions that people have to a set of words, a piece of information, an image, and, and then couple those with the identifications of that person. This person is a musician. This person is a woman. This person is um, of this age. This person is from this region this person has this kind of income. And I mean, this is an incredibly tall order technologically, but I feel like we could make so much better sense of, um, of pieces of information if we could see, oh, wow, this image produces this kind of recoil in this population. Anyway, it's a bit of a, a speech, but I want to share that that notion. Thank you, Michael. Um, Mark Thibault. Yeah, there's something that we don't, we don't speak uh, a lot about in, um, in the conversations we've, we're having is, is that, um, and, and you pointed to it, Michael, thank you, uh, about discomfort and how we deal with that. And we tend to be so uh, looking for, you know, the, our peace of mind. 
that just happened, you know, with the election and was so clear, just like as if suddenly everything would be great again. Right? And it's not. So what, and again, you know, going back to that role of, of the government is the power we're giving the government. And I agree hopefully with, with Grace. One day, mask is useless. The next, everybody should wear a mask. And it went on and on and on and on and on like this. So at the end of the day, I, 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 I'm always um, wondering how can we reintroduce the fact that we live um, in a world that is unpredictable. And yes, we have to deal with discomfort, with risks. In the Amazon, it's always present. You can be beaten by a snake. There's plenty of things, the visible and the invisible, that always makes you uh, face, you know, these different realities that can end your life. So, you know, they often say that they walk with death every single day. And we tend to forget that us in our modern societies. Oh, can I end with a joke from the Amazon? Oh, of course. Okay. Um, Does it start with like uh, it's very an, short. an indigenous person, an uh, oil person, and a priest walk into a bar? <laughs> no, no, not that one. I'm glad. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, Amazonian Indians say, uh, when the white man thinks, the Indian poops. I like. Thank you. You reminded me of uh, uh, this conversation. Uh, part of what Grace put on the on the table about what is the role of government and all that has me spinning on a bunch of different things, which included the Cobra effect. So the British Raj shows up in India, does a bunch of shitty things, takes over the most of the continent, and then there's a Cobra problem out there. So they put a bounty on Cobras. And it's like, hey, if you bring us a Cobra, uh, we will pay you money. And uh, uh, very quickly, people start raising Cobras. They start breeding cobras because they're worth they're worth a pound or a shilling or something. It's like uh, you know public policy is really hard. And then I'm thinking about smoking and car safety, uh, and smoking in particular because smoking there's secondhand smoke. I can't I, I can no longer stand going into an environment that has smoke. Like it really offends me. I leave. Um, and if we left smoking to the the we know you know 20 percent of the population still actually smokes. And if we, ha if we left smoking to everybody's personal choice, uh, our environment would be shaped really, really differently. And I don't know how to handle that. Um, and then there's issues like slavery and a bunch of other things where you kind of have to make proclamations, but we sort of went through that part of the conversation. But I'm busy spinning on how, you know, what is the role of government? What kind of government do we want? And I have a whole riff on how we've designed institutions that don't trust the average human. That like the basis of my, my standing philosophy at this moment is that I think we should switch to design from trust. And I own the site designfromtrust.com and I'd love to stand that up as a thing because when you start with assuming that most people have good intent, you build completely different systems. Although the systems and the norms and all that are incredibly important for governing behavior um, and you get better outcomes and you reweave the context of community and society because mostly designed from trust relies on humans making eye contact and getting figuring each other out and trusting one another in the different settings where this matters. Uh, so Grace, I'm like incredibly aligned with that part of what you're saying, like incredibly so. And then I come back to like car safety. Somebody, my, my mom hated seatbelts, hated seatbelts. And, and to her, you know, to her last ride in a car I would take the shoulder belt and put it behind her every time because it bothers her here. And I'm like, well, okay, but we, but we, you know, and I, and I used to own a 1962 Sunbeam Alpine that had seatbelts, but only because somebody installed old GM seatbelts in it afterward, it didn't come with seatbelts, right? And lo lots of humans stopped dying in cars when we started doing car safety things, but that had to be done at some greater national level. Uh, and then helmet laws for motorcyclists, for example, I think partly it's to protect motorcyclists. Partly, I don't want to have killed somebody because they rolled under my car and weren't wearing a helmet, <clears throat> right? I don't, I don't, I don't want the, the injury rate to go up because they were unsafe somehow. So all these things are all about public policy and I am an amateur in public policy, um, but we're trying to sort of sort our way through this. Uh, Stacy. and then I, I apologize, we've gotten really close to the end of our 90 minutes and we've barely made a dent actually in the queue, the check-in queue. 
but I love the conversation we've had. Um, and so I want to apologize for people who wanted to check in. I have kind of let go of the spreadsheet that, that uh, we created earlier for people who really wanted to check in. And I didn't start this call by saying, hey, if you really want to check in, ping me or do something out of band or just say so. Uh, so let me maybe do more of that in the next call. And with that, I'll go to Stacy, and then we'll uh, start winding down the call. Yeah, I'll be really quick. I just want to say that of the many people that I've spoken to that are against the vaccinations, I think it's important to know that there are two groups. So there's people that have reasonable questions about the vaccinations, but they fully know that COVID is real. And then there are people that don't believe it's real. They will cough in your face to show you what kind of a fool you are. And I don't think we should be lumping those two groups together, but we have to be aware that that other group is there. Indeed. Um, anyone with some thoughts about this call and about um, where we are right now, just sort of concluding thoughts for this call, something to take us out on. I think some of the salient points that we brought up are these, um, there's like, I would say three things. One is our emotional, like our, like our physical and emotional states as part of our sense-making mechanisms and that that's part of it. And especially when we're, when we're facing existential risk. And I think we live in a generation that never had to deal with that. Like, oh my goodness, plague and, you know, plague and war used to be part of everybody's life every day. It was like no big deal. And I, we, I think we, we need to really look at that. And I guess this, the, the second thing I think is, was really important around this sense-making is the context. When I'm trying to make sense of something, it's in the context of maybe taking an action or not taking an action. And there's also, there's a space in the world for sense-making mechanisms like this one. And there's a space in the world for action-making mechanisms. And that's also part of sense making of humanity. And I think those are, you know, and knowing where our roles are and what we're drawn to, and thinking about the context in which we're making sense making. Uh, that's what I would say I'm taking away from this. Thank you, Grace. And thank you for hanging in there with our call. Yeah, my customers will not thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All my deadlines are a day behind. <laughs> Um, anyone else? John? Yes, uh, lots of really you know, important thoughts. And uh, I, I, I missed about the first half hour, but I, I got a lot out of what everyone said. And this is not so much, this is not in opposition to anything anybody said. It a little bit builds on, on Grace's idea of context. I was going to talk about sense making, the life cycle of sense making, and in the sense that we come into a situation and our first criteria for sense is, is there enough familiarity in, with something that I'm sensing to what I already know that I have a grip, that I'm allowed to stay here, or, or that I want to stay here? And I might say, oh, this makes sense. Like I come into a party, I say, oh, this looks like it makes sense. A next question is, do the other people here <laughs> want me to, to be making sense with them? You know, so I've been, my first signal is for myself, this, is it familiar enough that I can navigate? Then am I getting any acceptance or rejection from other people? Then, okay, it's familiar, but what does it mean? You know, and I start trying to learn from it. And at the, at the tail end of the life cycle is, you know, I'm not making any new sense here. <laughs> you know, I've, I've made some sense, and it's not changing. So there's an innovation criteria that comes in. And also there's a competing context. You know, this, this context seems to have slowed down and there might be another one over there that's still going. And so maybe it's time for me to leave this one and go try to make sense of that other one. It's just another, it's another layer of uh, ecology with which to look at uh, sense-making. And it, it sets up a new set of um, criteria if you're trying to if you see yourself as wanting to help other people make sense out of something, you know, you, thinking about it in terms of that life cycle uh, might be helpful. I think we have Ken and maybe Eric. 
I was going to see if I could take us out with a poem. So if Eric wants to go first. Um, let's go, let's go Eric, then Ken. That's a lovely idea, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> There's something about not agreeing to people and about honesty that didn't really... I, I would love us as a group to be honest to each other, but also from a really deep, deep sense. Like whenever there is something I fundamentally don't agree on or something that makes me impatient being here in the group, I would like it to be named. And then once someone is honest, I don't want it to take up all the space because it can be so uncomfortable that it can become a hijacker of the whole conversation. And so there's a balance there to be found. And I just wanted to name that part. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. So Over to you in the little rectangle, Ken. This is uh, one of my favorite Roka poems. It's called The Winged Energy of Delight. And I'm reciting it partially because Gil asked uh, the question of how do we design from trust? And it's a poem about designing from trust. I think it's also a poem about midlife and transformation and change and kind of wraps all this stuff together. So just as the, way, the winged energy of delight carried you over many chasms early on, now raise high the daringly imagined arch holding up the astounding bridges. Miracle doesn't lie only in the amazing living through and defeat of danger. Miracle becomes miracle in the clear light of achievement that is earned in the world. To work with things is not hubris when building associations beyond words. For denser and denser the pattern becomes and being carried along is no longer enough. So take your well-developed strengths and stretch them between two opposing poles because inside the human heart is where God learns. May we all learn Thank you, Ken. You'll post that to the chat? Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Awesome call. Love these conversations. Really appreciate it. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks, everybody. Bye.